you know, if we multiply those together, right, what do we end up with, like, 10 to the minus 8 volts? So that's like 0.01 microvolts. I mean, so you didn't apply 1 volt, you applied 1 minus 0.10 to the minus 8 volts, right? So it's just not a big deal. And the reason it's not a big deal is because your current is tiny, right? It's all in the current. It doesn't have really to do with the solution resistance. I mean, you wouldn't want a high resistance, but it's all in the fact that we measure tiny currents. So we can get away with two electrodes because our current is so tiny. Um, and someday someone will ask for that. So you need to pull out that knowledge, you know, and then and it's how much we've thought about it before. Um, you know, why not, why not three electrodes? Just because our current is so tiny. Um, now, this is also the reason that do you really and a lot of your time in your experiment worrying about how close your reference electrode is to your working electrode. No, in fact, when we do a flow cell, we often just stick it down in the back. If we do it in a rat, we stick it on the other side of the brain because we don't want it to be anywhere near what we want to do, um, kind of thing. So as long as it's in the same solution, we're usually fine. And again, a little bit further, you know, oh, whoops, that was 12 ohms of you know, resistance instead of 10 to do, you know, kind of thing. So we don't care. But we break all the rules of traditional electrochemistry and not carry. Um, so we don't follow any of these rules. We don't care if we're putting close together. We don't care if we have a But that's the reason. It's all because the current is so small that we just get tiny high So I'm sure somebody has had more than that. Well, he asked me yesterday. Um, you know, so again, I'm trying to show you that you don't have to necessarily memorize all of this, but it's like a hopefully it makes kind of sense. And once you've thought about it once, you know, it's the kind of thing that you can pull back up. Uh, where somebody to ask you about that. Okay. <clears throat> all right, let's go on to another topic. I decided to skip all the mass transfer stuff in the chapter one and do it when we do chapter four. So, I skipped a whole bunch so I could finish today. Because it was actually pretty repetitive. Basically, meaning all I really wanted to know is we're going to chapter one anyway, so we are going to go cursor going to chapter four. The last thing I believe in chapter one is the concept of coupled chemical reactions. Okay, so coupled chemical reactions are again something that we don't necessarily use the words in our lab, but we do worry about. So this is not something that has no reference to your life. But again, you may not have called it that. And maybe that's bad because maybe we shouldn't call them a couple of chemical reactions. So I'm just going to give you two examples. So the first one is a couple of reversible reactions. Um, and so let's say that you have A, which is in equilibrium with O, and O, I'll give your hint, we're going to do this as our reaction. So O then is going to go to R, right? But uh, A can go back and forth um, with O, and it turns out, in this case, that a lot of times um, this A tends to be something that is, like, complex. So I don't know, think of, like, ADTA complex in calcium or magnesium or something like that. You know, and it can go in and out of being complex. There's an equilibrium there, but you can't go ahead and detect it until it comes out of the complex. I Meaning, once it's complex, you're not going to see it. Um, and so that's the kind of uh, couple chemical reaction they're talking about here. Um, and so, right, you could write up equilibrium coefficient um, for this concentration of O times the concentration of Y whatever the Q, I copied this out of the text, I don't know why they would use Q, Q is not charge, it's just the coefficient. Um, so, you know, towards the power of the concentration of A. And so, how much O you have, right, so normally when we just, you know, simply would be like, I put in one micromolar of O, and that would be my reaction. Right, well now, it's not so simple, right? You have to use an equilibrium coefficient to calculate how much O you would have given the conditions of, of all the other stuff that you put in to be able to do the reaction. Um, and so it gives you kind of a different uh, 
sort of no, Norm's equation uh, that you would do. This fine, all right, that's nice. Like this is like a reversible reaction, meaning this can go back and forth. We don't do too much of this. Let's look at a couple of irreversible reactions. So this one goes something like this. O plus N E goes to R, and then R irreversibly goes to something else, like T. All right, so R goes to T. Um, now, remember, you know, like basically, this part is irreversible. Um, so as we make R, right, some of it's going to go to T with some sort of rate constant. And so that means not all of R, right, is going to be available to go back to O, even if we wanted it to, right? Depending on the rate constant, some of it's going to have gone away. Um, and so um, I'm going to do all of the equations, but you can, you know, um, look at the fact that R, right, in this case, would disappear faster than just normal diffusion. So you would expect okay, that the amount of R you have to go away faster than just if it could get away by mass transfer. Okay, so I told you we didn't do this one. What in the lab is this? Neurotransmitters? Yeah, but which neurotransmitter do you think would be? May, it may be adenosine. The one I was thinking of is serotonin. Um, so um, the one, reason I was thinking of serotonin is we know that serotonin undergoes a fouling reaction, right? Uh, where it basically becomes something else, right? It becomes sort of a polymer that then sticks to the surface. Octopamine and tyramine do the same thing. I'm not so sure on adenosine. It's not just irreversible, which we'll talk in a minute. That but in some ways it may be because it goes from one to the other and then there's another reaction after that. However, it's another large chemical reaction. So it's a little different than just being a couple chemical reaction. But this is serotonin fouling. You know, uh, again, it has been, the textbook's not going to scream that to you. Um, but we see things like this where we make something and that something will react itself or another molecule. And so a lot of our skinning and that pretty much fouls our electrode in our lab. Uh, you know, it may, because it's polymerizing, that's a couple of chemical reaction. So again, we don't always use that term, but we do see them. Um, we don't always study the rate. But in this place, anyone done serotonin? What's the scan rate? Thousand. Thousand volts per second, right? So why do we go faster? It's to outrun the couple chemical reaction. Um, you know, so it's like, well, if we spend less time at the potential that we can make this thing at, you know, then we'll have less of that couple reaction. So while we and don't sit around and actually determine like what K is for that rate constant or anything, we do see a couple of chemical reactions um, in our lab and we're able to kind of uh, characterize those. Alright, that's the chapter one. I think we're gonna make a short break. Um, we may take a second.